Are you looking to get PMP certified and wondering where to get started? Look no further. This is the course that I've designed to walk you through the PMP exam and how to get certified. Welcome. My name's Phil. I call this the PMP Nano Bootcamp. This bootcamp is extremely rapid, so you might need to watch it a few times, but by the time we're done, you'll know all about the PMP exam, the direction, and the scope. So let's jump straight in. This bootcamp is brought to you courtesy of hpmexam.com, your one-stop shop for solutions to get you certified and beyond. In this bootcamp, I will walk you through all the details for PMP certification. I have over 20 years of experience managing projects and programs. I have over six certifications in project management. Six of those are in Agile. Many of those are in things like risk and schedule, and I'm PMP certified. I got certified back in 2005. Since I got certified, I've been helping people and companies, organizations worldwide in their project management. As you can see here, some of my clients include the FBI, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Army, NASA, the Department of Transport, the Department of Commerce, and the U.S. Air Force. I'm one of those engineers, you can say, who escaped from the work site, <laughs> but I didn't forget all that I learned. I've been very focused on helping project managers across the world get good and great in their project management. There are different levels of project management, and what I seek to do is help PMs to be truly great, not just pass the exam, but be truly great project managers. My firm is called Praiseon Media, and here are some of our clients worldwide. Some of these you might recognize. My background is very vast. In addition to my engineering degree in civil engineering and my master's in construction information technology, I've worked for various organizations from banking all the way to gaming. My buddy Roy is my co-trainer. You'll see him quite a lot on this course. We built out the agile portions of this course together. Now, you might ask, what do I need to get PMP certified? This is what you need. If you have a secondary school or high school diploma, you need 60 months of unique, non-overlapping project management experience. And on top of that, you need 35 hours of education in project management. If you have a four-year degree, then you just need three years of experience in project management. And if you went to a globally accredited college, they call it a GAC accredited program for your bachelor's or master's, then you need 24 months of unique non-overlapping professional project management experience and 35 hours of education in project management. And that's about it. The exam is broken down into three portions of people, process, and business. The people domain is 42% of the exam, the process domain is 50, and the business domain is just 8% of the exam. You can also slice the exam into two pieces. Half is agile and hybrid, and the other half can be looked at as predictive. Here's the general project management timeline. Way back in 2560 BC, the Pyramids of Giza is a great example of project management. And project management began to evolve through the Great Wall of China, Frederick Taylor and Henry L. Gantt, who is responsible for the Gantt chart. Earned value came on the scene in the late 50s. IPMA, an organization of project management in the mid-60s, followed by PMI in the 1960s, late 60s, 69. And then, as time evolved, we had the first PMP exam and PRINCE II. Lean manufacturing became more prevalent. The first Scrum project in 1993, Scrum was formalized, and the Agile Manifesto was published in 2001, all the way to 2021, right? Where we began talking more about hybridization and different specialisms beyond just the regular. So project management has evolved. Somewhere along the line, the PMI put this model on the map. I have encapsulated it in something called the Process Group Pentagon, where we take a look at what exactly we need to do to make a project run. We initiate it or authorize it, we plan it, we execute it, we do the work, we monitor and control the project, and we close the project. In addition to that, we also look at knowledge areas of integrating all the moving parts, scoping out the project, scheduling it, costing it, thinking about quality and resources, Thinking about communications and risk, I put risk in the middle as a bullseye because risk touches everything. 
procurements and stakeholders. These are all areas we think about in project management. Did you know that 90% of global senior executives rank project management as either critical or somewhat important to the ability to deliver successful projects and remain competitive? This is from a survey from the PMI, 90%. Now, what does that tell you? When 90% of global executives have woken up to smell the coffee, it tells us project management is here to stay. It also tells us that project management is critical. So you, as a professional, are doing the right thing in thinking about upping your game in project management, because project management is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And that's why through the years, since 1969, the PMI have been hyper-focused in project management practices and ideas and principles. And this exam, the PMP exam, is based on PMI's understanding of project management being mega important, so hyper important. So for this exam, there's a number of things you need to know in addition to the process groups and the knowledge areas that I just showed you. There's some other important aspects of the exam, so let's dive into those. The PMI, like I said, was founded in 1969. It's a nonprofit and they've standardized project management standards and techniques. And in addition to the PMP, they have a lot of other certifications. But take a look at the growth of the PMP exam. This is way back in the early 80s. Let's zoom in a little bit here. You can see we had 40 PMPs. That number has grown in leaps and bounds. The last time I put this together, back in 2015, was showing 655,000. Now, if I was going to improvise and draw what it is today, it would go through the roof because today we have 1.5 million approximately. That number doubled in the past nine years. Isn't that crazy? Think about it. From 1984 to 2015, the number doubled in less than half that time. So this tells you that the world of project management is evolving and it makes sense to get on the bandwagon and just get certified as a PMP by putting in the work, putting in the effort. I've already gone through the knowledge areas with you. This is common knowledge for the exam, so you have to get the language down of integration, overall coordination, scoping, identify what needs to be done, developing a schedule in schedule management, estimating the costs and manage them in cost management, quality management, identifying the quality standards and meeting them, resource management, human, equipment, materials, supplies, thinking of those things and managing them, communications, planning how to communicate and managing that, risk management, planning and managing uncertainty, procurement management, managing contracts and procurements, and stakeholder management, managing stakeholder engagement. All of these things are critical for the exam. Now, there are different flavors of project management. There's a predictive approach, which is I plan from A to B. I have all the details. It's quite straightforward. You know, when we talk about predictive project management, it's understanding pretty much the full scope of what is required and planning everything needed to get to the end. That's predictive project management. But that's not the only project management there is. There's another flavor of project management, and we call this adaptive. And we use adaptive when we are not 100% sure of how to proceed. So we proceed in what we call iterations, in baby steps of experiments or sprints. And then we might be off course, and then we get back on track, and then we course correct when we're going off again. And ultimately, we do get to the end, but it's in a different way. We plan in increments, right? And that is called the world of Agile. We are incremental in our planning. We are iterative in how we finalize what we're working on for a short time box. So we say Agile is iterative and it's incremental as well. Think about it like you were cooking a dish that you never cooked before. You would always have these question mark touch points. Is this what you want? Am I on the right track? Is this what you want, customer? That's pretty much how the world of Agile is. In the Stacy model, we see the requirements uncertainty on the y-axis and technical uncertainty on the x-axis. And the summary of it is if you are in a simple zone, 
of understanding, a simple zone where you pretty much understand the project very well. You are close to agreement on the requirements. You are close to certainty on the technicality, the technical approach. There's nothing wrong in being predictive right here. But as you begin to move away into the world of uncertainty, going further and further away from close to agreement on the requirements, further and further away from f uh, certainty on the x-axis, you then enter this complex zone. And this is where Agile thrives, because Agile helps you to bring down the level of anarchy, right? When you do things intentionally in sprints, you do it the right way. This is where Agile thrives. So the question of Agile or Waterfall, it's gonna come up quite a bit on your exam and you need to understand when it is best to use Agile and when it is best to use, we call it predictive, but in a lot of circles, it's called Waterfall. Quite incorrectly, if I may add, but we'll give it a pass for now. So we'll just say, Predictive methods work best when the requirements are well understood, little chance of change, so on and so forth. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Let's move on. Moving along, Agile is becoming increasingly popular in organizations. And the reason is this. When you take a look at organizations in the world, at the time this was put together, 71% of organizations reported using Agile. Now the number has gone into the 80s. I would even wager that the number has gone higher, but I'll be conservative. But think about it. Majority of firms use Agile. Now, why do some firms not employ Agile approaches? Here's why. There are concerns and fears, right? People fear losing their job. They fear they won't have anything to do. If they're Agile, people think there will be change chaos and there'll be no planning and no one will do anything. And, and that is not true, okay? Agile actually gets us involved in planning like never before in a different way. We plan at the strategy level in this world of Agile. The executives are encouraged to plan at that level. They're encouraged to plan at the portfolio and product level. We have product roadmaps, we have release plans, right? We have iteration plans. We call them sprint planning sessions, right? And then we have down to the day, we plan down to the day. So how on earth can anyone argue that it doesn't make sense to be agile? Agile is pretty much a philosophy. It is, first of all, adjusting your mindset to pivot to the world around you pretty much on demand as needed. An agile mindset is one that is quick to respond but it's not just the mindset, it's the actions. And we're very passionate about this. That's why my co-trainer Roy and I, we wrote this book. It's called Agile Principle Raw and Uncut. This is one of the books we're going to be offering at hpmexam.com for the bootcamp that's coming up in a few days. You don't wanna miss it because you're gonna get this book that covers Agile in a very pragmatic and expert way, all right? so. Check out hpmexam.com. If you come aboard that course, you're going to get that book about Agile. And we're going to walk you through all these things that I'm going over here. They are well covered in the book. Another big piece of Agile is the mindset of servant leadership. In the world of Agile, we promote self-awareness. We promote listening, serving those on the team, helping people grow, coaching versus controlling, promoting safety, respect, and trust and promoting the energy and intelligence of others. These are huge to us in the world of Agile, okay? Now, like I said, the PMP exam is broken into three components, and we are gonna be covering those three components at a super high level today. We're also gonna be going deeper in our half-day bootcamp at hpmexam.com, and we're gonna be breaking them down into smaller pieces that you can digest. But let's start off right here. Let's go into the people domain and let me begin to unravel what the exam is about. Because if you remember the very beginning, I told you we have people, process, and business. These three domains. So let's go through the domains very briefly. Domain number one. People. First of all, the PMI wants you to understand you as a project manager, 
you will be involved in conflict resolution, conflict facilitation. You will need to understand the Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument that I'm showing on the screen. You have the option of force or direct or collaborate or problem solve or compromise or reconcile, avoid or withdraw, smooth or accommodate. Which one will you choose? This is one of the topics on the exam. Second topic is leading a team. You will need to understand servant leadership, as I mentioned earlier, being aware of the 10 tenets of servant leadership as set forth by Robert Greenleaf. But not just that, you also need to understand the Hersey Blanchard situational leadership model. You don't lead like a one-trick pony, you shouldn't. You should be flexible, able to adapt to the individual and the circumstance. On the exam, you will also be tested on Tuckman's five stages of team development. Tuckman's ladder, just understanding that this dynamic happens in firms. Okay, happens where you have teams coming together and so on. Quick question for you. You are the servant leader of an agile project. A team member who is typically outspoken seems withdrawn and discouraged. She needs a whole lot of support and little direction. Which leadership approach are you most likely to use for this employee? What do you think? Whole lot of support, little direction. What do you think? Okay, so let's go back and I'll explain. A whole lot of support is up here, right? Because this is supportive behavior on the y-axis. So a whole lot of support is over here, right? Little direction is over here. This is the confluence, right? So the best answer for that question is you want to be more supporting, right? She doesn't need direction, so don't go delegating on her. She doesn't need... Um, I beg your pardon, she doesn't need direction, so don't go um, coaching on her. Um, delegating is less support, and democratic is not even one of the approaches that we mentioned. So uh, democratic is where you're bringing people together for consensus. So that's kind of a different type of leadership outside of the main topic here. All right, so the best answer to this would have been supporting. And these are just a few of the ideas that we bring to our class to discuss with you. What is the best leadership style for managing a project? Ah, I think this one, you're gonna get this one right because now you know the trick. You shouldn't be a one trick pony, right? So the best answer to this, my friends, is the most fitting for the project and the team, okay? It's really all about the Hersey Blanchard model. All right, still in the people domain, we talk about supporting team performance that's another task that you're meant to be able to do. You're also meant to empower team members and stakeholders. And empowerment is responsibility, giving away accountability, uh, accountable tasks to the team, or just letting the team step up and be accountable themselves. You know, in the world of Agile, we don't push on people. Instead, we look for a more volunteer approach, more autonomous approach, and you will be tested about that. Do you know that in the world of Agile, we are more team-led than centralized, right? In the world of Agile, we don't rely on a one belly button accountable team leader. Instead, it's distributed across the entire team. Something else you need to know for the people domain is ensure team members and stakeholders are adequately trained. You also need to understand how to build a team and part of the tenets I just mentioned will come into play here. You also need to understand what it means to address and remove impediments, obstacles, and blockers. What it means to negotiate project agreements, because there's all sorts of agreements, right? What it means to collaborate with stakeholders, understanding the power interest grid, you know, also call the influence impact grid when we change the dimensions or we change the parameters on the X and the Y. So understanding this grid uh, will come up as well and understanding the SEAM, the Stakeholder Engagement Assessment Matrix. So things like that you will encounter throughout our, our training. 
Also building a shared understanding. The PMI expects you to understand how to do that, how to engage and support virtual teams, the importance of ground rules, team charter, social contract, team contract, all the same thing. You got to understand those as well and mentoring relevant stakeholders. You got to understand mentoring is important and you should dedicate time to do that. Last but not least in the people domain, we have promote team performance through the application of EI, emotional intelligence. All right. So my friends, that's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. But here's the good news. You don't need to go that distance alone. That is just one piece of what I have for you today. As I mentioned earlier, we are having a half day boot camp. And this half day boot camp, it is part of a bigger course that you will definitely find value from. And I'm going to walk you through the steps in this course and you can decide, is this something that will benefit my career long term? Let's take a look real quick. So we have a live half day boot camp. Look for the details at hpmexam.com. Okay. hpmexam.com is your one stop shop. Like I said, for not just PMP training, but even beyond, because this course is a lifetime access course. So here are the different pieces of it. Half day boot camp where we tackle in detail the people, the process, and the business domains, right? When we go into people below the surface that I'm showing you here and process and business, the next step is for you to take mock exams, for you to take quizzes, for you to beef up your understanding. And here's how we do it. We have on our learning management system, people, process, and business explained over 40 hours of additional content. That's right, four zero, 40 hours. So in 40 hours, you will be able to go over people, the 14 tasks, process, the 14 tasks, business, the four tasks, PMBOK 6, all the knowledge areas, PMBOK 7, the principles, the domains, you will have access, lifetime access, by the way, right? This is lifetime access to go over all of these and also the agile practice guide training. You will have training that goes into every detail you need for your PMP exam. And not just that, you will get the agile principle run and cut book in addition to the lifetime access course. We'll deliver this to you by PDF very speedily. You're also going to get this called Project Management Essentials. This is a 400 page book. You can see these are high quality books that have been put together as a result of my work in project management over the past two decades. I'm a buddy Roy. And last but not least, you're going to get this book. It's called PMP Exam Immersion. Now, why do we provide all this literature? Well, all this literature is to help you to find areas of improvement. You may not need to read all of this information. What you do need to hone in on is your weak areas because remember, PMI expects that you have project management experience. So there are some things you might already know pretty well, but there are going to be some things you're like, ouch, that hurt. <laughs> I need to go read that up. And that's why we have these flavors. So the PMP exam immersion book covers people, process, and business. Okay, we deliver that to you. It's about 587 pages. Then we have project management essentials, which is more for the predictive elements that you may be finding you need more help on. And this is for the agile areas. Now, to bring it all together and hybridize it, we have this. And to be quite honest, a lot of our students just read this and a lot of this. Some of them read this more if they feel they have agile knowledge, but not enough predictive information. So we deliver a smattering of materials to you. We also have a 25 hour download MP3 for you to listen to around the clock. And then we have two full mock exams and many smaller quizzes and tests to beef up your understanding. 
The other cool thing about this program is you're not alone because we have other people studying and they meet over the weekend in a boot camp. This is a brilliant offer that you don't want to let get away because right now it is at a steal. Let me show you one more piece of this offer that I have not made visible like this before. The final piece that actually costs more than the course is this. It's called Life After the PMP Exam. And what you're going to get from here is live coaching and training with me after you get certified. And you're also going to get a lifetime access course to help you achieve excellence. And that's about 10 PDUs in addition to the live training that I just talked about after the exam. This is a ridiculous steal, my friends, that you don't want to get away because the cost of life after the PMP exam is actually more than the cost of the course. So this is a great way for you to get in and secure lifetime learning. Lifetime learning and when you come on the program, you have a place to go to as a professional. You have a project management family because it's not enough for you to be in a massive gathering where you feel lost, no. Here we have individuals who have been through the program for PMP and are now learning and teaching with me and coming along. This is definitely something you want to do. So to sign up for this program, you need to go on down to hpmexam.com. Don't miss a minute. Don't miss a beat. Go there right now and sign up. And the moment you sign up, we begin our journey together. We have one of the main hpmexam.com boot camps coming up. You will be in that live boot camp with me. You will learn people process business, and then we will begin our deeper journey to start digging into the material under the hood, going into people squarely, 14 tasks, videos, very engaging to watch in front of a live audience, by the way. This is not material that was recorded uh, in isolation. You will actually hear students' voices. You will feel like you are part of a participative audience, okay? And like I said, it's a lifetime access course. So what do you have to lose? Absolutely nothing. You will always be able to refer to the tenets and the ideas beyond your PMP. And like I said, after you get certified, you'll be welcome to join me in life after the PMP exam, where I will be equipping you, right? And this is two and a half hours over four months. If you go to hpmexam.com, I don't think you'll believe the price point, but that price point will not be there forever. It will be going away. So I need you to go on down to hpmexam.com right now. Look for the link in the description below, wherever you're watching, whether on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, wherever you're watching, capitalize on this deal right now because it's not very frequent you get these sort of lifetime offers to not only get PMP certified, but to go beyond your certification, okay? So over the past number of minutes, we talked about the people domain. I walked you through the 14 tasks. Now we're going to go over the process domain and we're going to go over the 17 tasks. But hold on tight because this is going to go very quick. Are you ready? Let's jump in. The process domain, 17 tasks. You ready? Now, before I go into the process domain, I want to alert you to a very important page in the Agile Practice Guide. This is where we have the breakdown of predictive, iterative, incremental, and agile. And this is one of the things we hone in on on our course. Also, understanding the continuum of life cycles will hone in on that as well. And Scrum. Now, we don't have enough time to do that today, but we will go deep into Scrum in the training, and I will be unraveling and explaining the intricacies. There's a lot of tiny little intricacies 
when it comes to Scrum that is very easy to blow past. I got certified as a Scrum Master in 2011, about 13 years ago. But I tell you, there's a lot of stuff I blew past. I will be highlighting those things so you don't get lost, okay? And also on the program, you'll also be able to listen to my buddy Roy, who will share some insights. He'll talk about various aspects of the course. Now, before we go any further, I'll let you get a little uh, insight into um, my buddy Roy and his um, perspectives about this particular task. Execute the project with urgency required to deliver business value. I want you to get a little taste of what Roy has to say. So let's listen. Let's go. Yeah, so it's actually a really valuable thing to do, regardless of the process that you're following, to try to find ways of doing things incrementally, not just for um, you know, gaining feedback, which is a huge value, but also you could potentially get incremental return. So if you can do things in smaller chunks, deliver them, get some kind of return, either knowledge or you know, re um, in, in uh, funds or whatever it happens to be, delivering things incrementally can be a major benefit for your organization. Uh, now, what we want to try to do is we want to try to build things in what we call an MVP. I want to I want to be clear on there are three uh, 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 you know little phrases that we're, we're going to go through: MV, MVP, MMP, and MMF. Acronym soup here, right? But we'll we'll get there. All right. So the, the intent with this is to discover the minimum amount of functionality we could deliver in order to get some kind of return out of it. And again, return could be happy customers or knowledge or whatever it happens to be. Let's talk about those three different uh, you know, phrases. So first there's the MVP, that is the minimum viable product. Now people often get the MVP confused. It's misused all over the place. Quite honestly, I misuse it intentionally because it's such a familiar term. I'll use it regardless of what I'm trying to say because it just it's just an easy term for people to remember. But MVP is supposed to mean to discover the minimum viable product. It is a discovery, it's a learning exercise of discovering is this product or this thing that you're delivering, is it a viable thing that people would are going to want to make use of? It does not mean you have to build anything. You could just do it as an experiment, doing some surveys, doing whatever it happens to be, that can be your minimum viable product. Just talking with people could be an MVP, just to make sure that you're going the right direction and it's something worthwhile doing, right? It's an experiment, it's a learning exercise. It could include functionality or it may not include functionality. Now, the next one is the MMP. MMP is minimum marketable product. Now, this is different. This is actual functionality. It's the smallest amount of functionality or features or scope, if you will, that you can deliver to get some kind of return. Do you always have to deliver everything in the specification or in the original request to actually get some kind of return out of it? Maybe you can incrementally do it, the minimum chunk of that functionality in order to get some kind of return. Now, the next one is the MMF. MMF is minimum marketable feature. So MMP is the entire product, something that you are usually used. MMP is usually used when you're doing something greenfield, something brand new, something that you know is not already existing. You're trying to find the discover to discover the smallest amount of stuff that you have to do to deliver that initial product delivery. MMF are the additions to that. What's the minimum set of functionality that you need to do to have a a, a, a usable chunk of functionality or features or scope or whatever that's actually going to get some kind of return. So you you will need to know those terms. MVP in particular is the most widely used. Also, the most widely misused term, um, but you, you get the idea. There, there are ways of encouraging the minimum. Every one of these has something in common. Minimum, right? The minimum viable, minimum marketable. There's another term actually as well, the minimum business increment. It's the same basic concept, right? It's the smallest amount of stuff that you can use, do to get some kind of return, right? You get the idea. So we're always focusing on the smallest amount. The PSI, it may be a piece or the whole of the MVP or MMB or whatever, right? It's the it's doing things in small increments and sometimes assembling them to get something larger and more useful. Back to you, Phil. Awesome stuff from our buddy Roy there. Thank you, Roy, as always. So that is a very good opener for the first task. Execute project with the urgency required to deliver business value. And Roy 
implicitly covered this. You want to understand the opportunity through a different lens. And he called this taking a look at the MVP, minimum viable product. But that's just one. That's just one thing in 17. So let's get our skates on and let's begin covering all the other pieces that you need to know in process, the process domain, okay? So again, that is number one. Let's go to number two. Number two, before that is manage communications. Manage communications is analyzing the communication needs, determining the frequency of communication, and communicating appropriately, monitoring the communication, and so on. Then we go into risk management. We talk about assessing the risks, managing the risks on the project. Whether we're in the world of predictive or in the world of agile, we do this. We just do it in different ways. All right, let's move on to the next thing. The next thing we are expected to know is engaging stakeholders. We talked a little bit about this in the people domain, but this is going a little bit more technical into some of the tools and stuff. Then we talk about plan and manage budget and resources. Talking about managing the cost, and that of course involves determining the cost, but you go the next step and you ensure that it is effectively managed based on the resources that you have on the project and the time phased budgets at completion have to be effectively managed. Then we talk about planning and managing the schedule. We determine the timeline for the project. That is a huge one. Uh, that's the project manager's bread and butter. I always say that because without a timeline, what are you managing the project to, right? Because we say project management is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to a project that is a temporary endeavor. Temporary means it has a beginning and an end. And we use our schedule to really harness in that control of getting to the end at the right time. Then we've got plan and manage quality of products and deliverables. Quality in my mind is four things. Let's pin down what quality is, right, for a quick second. Quality is fitness for use, conformance to requirements, customer satisfaction, and Kaizen. It's all those things. Because not only do you want to have a quality management plan, you've got to execute it, and you've got to always keep challenging yourself from a quality perspective. And that means Kaizen, change for the better, change for the better. All right, let's move on beyond Number seven, we have the next one, number eight, under process, plan and manage scope. Scope is a very humongous beast, and we will be tackling the beast in the course because we have to do many things. We have to plan scope management. We have to come out with a scope management plan and a requirements management plan in, in some instances. And then we have to collect the requirements, define scope, create the WBS, and we have to talk about validating the scope. And that means the customer will validate that we indeed got all the scope inherent in the deliverable. And then we also need to control scope as project manager. So this is a huge one that we tackle in the program. Moving on, we have integrate project planning activities. And that means when all is said and done, when you've planned everything out, you then need to integrate all the moving parts. Now, again, this is one of those areas that I would love for you to hear my buddy Roy on because he could give you some agile insights on integration. You know, we don't often use the word integrative planning when we're talking about the world of agile. And that's why this course is so good because it brings together the best of both worlds. It brings together the understanding and the consciousness of predictive, is not useless. Agile is great. It's not the only thing we should do. How about we hybridize? Okay. So that understanding and that mindset is what this course brings to the table for you. So without much ado, let's move on to listen to my buddy Roy one more time. He's going to break down this topic of integration from an agile angle. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, um, planning activities are happening on ongo are ongoing throughout the entire process. 
uh, in an agile in an agile agile space. Remember the planning onion, right? So you have five different levels. There's there's another view of the planning onion where there's six levels where strategy is your top level, and that's that's fine. That's incorporating some portfolio kinds of activities. Um, but the idea is that high level planning to start with, lower level planning as you get deeper and deeper into the cone of uncertainty. Uh, throughout the entire process, we are planning and replanning and replanning based on the changes we discover and the knowledge that we've dis that we've gained throughout the entire process. So high level plans are right, where you start, you get deeper and deeper, more and more planning, all the way down to daily planning. So we are constantly planning and replanning because again, just keep in mind, agile is a change based process. You can't have that single perfect plan in a change based process because your plan is changing, right? And that's the idea. That's why we always plan. Back to you, Phil. Great stuff, Roy. Let's move on to this question. Why does Scrum make it difficult for product owners to make changes to a sprint that is underway? What do you think? Based on what you know about the world of Scrum. For those of you that don't know much about the world of Scrum, guessing is allowed. You want to take a little guess? All right. Well, let's take a look at what the answer is. The answer to this is, drum roll. Psst, it's B. The answer is B. It's because asking the team to make a real commitment comes with an associated cost of not shifting the basis of that commitment in mid sprint. Now we're not saying that changes never happen in the world of Scrum. We're just saying that we do our best to limit that. We do our best to discourage needless change. Once the sprint is airborne, I often use the analogy, once the cabin doors close and you're 40,000 feet in the air, you ain't letting no person on that plane. That's how it is in the world of Scrum. The sprint, we need to respect that. Okay, There's nothing wrong in taking additional work and putting it in the backlog, but taking that work and shoving it into a sprint backlog is a whole different thing. All right, let's move on. We're almost half of the way, if not more than half of the way. So let's jump into our next area. The next area is manage project changes. And managing project changes is all about anticipating the need for change and staying ahead of the curve, just like a great chess player, right? Anyone play chess out there? You're always thinking, you're always trying to anticipate or predict what your opponent will do. And when they fall into the trap, got him, right? That's how it should be in the world of change management. We want to anticipate what is coming before it does. So one of the long list of things to be aware of in change management is right here on the screen, okay? You want to go through these one by one. So let's start off from the very first. Stakeholder asks for something verbally. Don't stop there. Put it in formal writing and then put it in the change log. And then you can analyze the change with the team. Analyze the change request and then you send it to the change control board, a body of people responsible for changes on the project. Now, in all honesty, not every project has a change control board. Some projects, they don't. Some projects, it's your boss. <laughs> Some projects, it's you and your boss that are the change control board. So just be aware that what you're seeing here does not happen on every single project, but it's good to understand the motions, right? The change board review the change request and the analysis, and they decide the outcome. Project manager or CCB member puts that outcome into a change log and shares it with the wider body of stakeholders. And the project manager and the team carry out next steps if the change request was approved. But there could also be segues at point six where the change control board asks for more information, where you may need to bring in the sponsor and the customer if they're not in the CCB, but all roads will lead back into the main chain where at the end of the day, you will need to make a decision as the CCB whether it's many people or one person or two people, you need to approve, reject, put it on hold or pend in something else. But the bottom line is you are going to change. Now, my buddy Roy always has great insights about changes. And that's why I keep wanting to bring him in so that you can get an idea of how we tackle change 
in the world of Agile. It's a little bit different. When we think about change in the world of Agile, we are actually looking forward to change, right? The Agile Manifesto says we should welcome changes, even late in development. So let's listen to what Roy has to say about change in an Agile world. Roy. Uh, so managing change in Agile, that's what it's all about, right? <laughs> this is the whole purpose of Agile, right? So we, the, the, the main thing is that we, um, that you need to accept the change, right? So the first is to start with the mindset, the behavior, that change is inevitable, it's going to happen. So you can, you can try to ignore change happening or ignore the potential for change to happen, but it's going to happen, right? So even in those things, those, those projects that we feel could be our best suited for predictive, there's still likely going to be change that's going to occur. So start by assuming change is going to happen. Get comfortable with unknowns. That's the way Agile is going to work. You will be uncomfortable for a fair bit of it because there are so many unknowns. Get comfortable with that concept. Um, now, the reason that we allow change to happen is because it is in our customer's best interest. It is in our best interest to allow that change to happen so that we can build better products for our customers. For if, if our primary focus is customer satisfaction, building according to, a, according to a plan, which may be flawed, is not going to build customer satisfaction. Changing in order to build for customer satisfaction means changing your plan, right? So we're going to allow that stuff to happen naturally. Again, um, when we, we do our, our the, allow these changes, it's not change chaos. We want to be very d disciplined about it. Any change that comes in, we evaluate it against priorities of other work and the size of the other work. So we go, instead of going to a change control approach of trying to not let change happen, we instead allow the change to happen and then negotiate that change with other things that are already prioritized. So instead of controlling it, we negotiate it. It's, it's, a, it's a different mindset, a different approach. Okay, back to you, Phil. Awesome stuff, as always, Roy. Let's take a look at this. A major theme in Scrum is inspect and adapt. Which of the following best summarizes that theme? Is it A, Scrum insists on auditors who frequently inspect the work? Is it B, Scrum recommends that upper management inspect the burndown charts? Is it C, Scrum emphasizes taking a short step of development, inspecting both? Or is it D? I'll let you read it. It's a bit of a long question. So take your time and let's see what you come up with. All right. Well, hit the pause button if you need more time. So, let me explain the answer, okay? The best answer to this is option C. Scrum emphasizes taking a short step of development, inspecting both the results, both the resulting product and the efficacy of current practices, and then adapting the product goals and process practices. So when we say inspect and adapt, right? All the other options are not it. They are not correct, okay? All right, well, we've had a lot of fun so far. For those of you who are just coming, I wanna remind you that we have the hpmexam.com bootcamp. All you need to do is go on down to hpmexam.com Take a look at the upcoming date, sign up, you'll be able to be on a live half-day boot camp. And you will also get on-demand lifetime access. You will also get, after you are certified, you will get access to life after the PMP exam. And the life after the PMP exam curricula is a combination of my ideas and the great work of my mentor, John C. Maxwell, who wrote the book, How to Be a Real Success. He wrote the book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership and More. In this curriculum, I'm gonna be going through my book, as you can see here, How to Succeed After the PMP Exam. This is a dialogue that is going to help elevate your game as a PMP. It will show you what you need to do to really succeed, how to be a real success. I'm gonna show you 
what John thinks. I'm going to show you what I have found to be pragmatic in the world of project management to help you exceed, not just to be a PMP, but to be a PMP plus. All right. So to be part of that, go on down to hpmexam.com. We're covering the people, the process, and the business domains in great detail. All right, so let's jump back into where we were before we took a little break. We were talking about the process domain and we had talked about changes and I had given you a little exercise. I hope you found that to be helpful. Let's move on to the next task. The next task is plan and manage procurement. So everything to do with buying what you need from outside the firm, be it a service, be it a result, be it a sub-deliverable. Also part of this exam is managing project artifacts, plans, deliverables, those things are talked about. So in the world of Scrum, you know, we have these artifacts. We talk about the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. Those are artifacts, but that's not all. You know, we could look at other things. We could look at the information radiator. We could look at other things, you know, like burn down charts, burn up charts. Those are also artifacts. In the world of predictive, we have many different plans and baselines, and those could be looked at as artifacts as well. So artifacts is a very vast topic that you need to uh, master for your exam. Okay, well, let's move on here. Moving on to the next thing, we have determine appropriate project methodology, methods and practices. And we've already talked about this when I showed you the, um, the Stacy complexity model and you know we, we had that dialogue um, about it. And taking a look at the Stacy model, the big question here is, am I more in the, the predictive zone or am I more in the Agile zone, or am I somewhere in the middle? Okay. I would love to hear from our friend again, our buddy Roy. Let's hear what Roy has to say about this. Roy. Yeah, so this is, this is something PMI has done actually quite well, and that is to help people understand which methodologies that you can make use of. Now, the Stacey diagram is one method that we can make use of, and just to remind everybody what the Stacey diagram is all about, um, we have these two different areas, or th technically three different areas to, 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 to think about. There's the simple space, which is 100% agreement, 100% certain. We know exactly what we're doing, and that might be one approach. That's where predictive thrives in that space. Then we start moving into the complicated space. We're still close to agreement and close to certainly certainty. There might be a little bit of variability going on, but it's really not that complicated. Predictive can continue to work in that space. Then we move into the complex space, the complex domain. Now that's where you have a lot more uncertainty. Now you have a lot more unknowns. If you remember, I think we went through this with this group, uh, the two examples complicated is kind of like assembling a watch, follow the rules exactly every single step and you're gonna have a successful delivery at the end. Complex is more like driving to work. You know where you're going, you know generally how you're gonna get there. You may have done it multiple times, but there's a thousand different things that could change how you actually achieve those results. So that's where Agile, the adaptive processes, start to really uh, uh, provide a value for you, where there's a lot of variability, or at least more variability, that, that Agile handles that extremely well. Now, you also may be all the way up in the anarchy space, and believe it or not, a lot of projects are based in this, especially in the software world. Anarchy kind of rules. It's not just complex, it's chaos. Uh, so in those spaces, absolutely, you need an empirical model and that is that that's what agile is based on remember the empirical process control methodology it's based on a way of handling this complexity it's a way of solving complex problems um, so you can you make use of these tools and there are different things that you can choose along the way you could choose iterative you could choose incremental you could choose full on agile you could choose full predictive you know based on the different domain that your project work may be in um, i wouldn't i would suggest though that if you are thinking about just a purely incremental or a purely iterative approach, why not just do Agile? Because Agile does both of them, right? It gives you the value of both. So usually what you see organizations doing is not saying we're going to do iterative or we're going to do incremental. Usually what you're going to see is we're going to do predictive or Agile, right? So that's, that's a more common approach. 
All right, back to you, Phil. Anything else we should talk about? Well, that about sums it up. Great stuff from our buddy Roy. Let's move on to the next slide. And here we have it's another question. Check in your attention span. <laughs> okay. The Agile Manifesto states that the sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain what? I know some of you are new to this, but it gives you a nice introduction to the subject matter, doesn't it? So what do you think? Sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain what? All right. The best answer, taking it directly from the Agile Manifesto, is a constant pace. Indefinitely. Constant pace does not necessarily mean fast, right? It could be fast, but it doesn't mean it has to be fast. It's like the tortoise and the hare. Remember that story? Great. All right. Here's another fun one. Simplicity, the art of what? Those of you Agile Manifesto readers, what do you think the answer is? All right. This simply states, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done, is essential. Okay. Let's move on to our next area. The next area for the exam is established project governance structure. And what does this mean? Well, governance is not a bad word. When people hear governance, they think of it as a harsh word. You know, and honestly, in a lot of instances, people generally may not like to be governed because it conjures up images of being told what to do. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're saying is having structure for authority and people understanding what authority they can exercise on a project. The PMI say governance is a framework within which authority is exercised. So governance can be expected on the exam. Let's move on. The next one is manage project issues. There are all sorts of issues you can encounter on the project. Just remember that a risk is an uncertain event. An issue is an event happening right now. So there's a difference. But both can be looked at through a similar lens. Uncertainty, if not checked, becomes sudden in many instances. And when it becomes sudden, it's too late. Why not take some risk mitigation measures before your risk becomes an issue, right? In the world of Agile, we talk about these issues being impediments, obstacles, and blockers. And it's a different language, but it's similar. We talk about impediment logs in the world of Agile. We talk about issue logs in the world of predictive. Number 16, ensure knowledge transfer for project continuity. Ensure that knowledge can be transferred by opening up dialogues and expressing uh, honesty and truthfulness to the team, transparency, right? That's all part of it. And part of the PMP exam is having the right mindset. And that is one more thing I'm going to cover with you before we finish today, the mindset for PMP exam success. And part of it is being transparent, being open, being honest, which is part of knowledge transfer. We don't want to hoard knowledge. That's being insecure. We want to share knowledge, give knowledge, right? And power as well. All right. Number 17, plan and manage project or phase closure or transitions. What are we saying here? You got to plan how to transition out of the project. You got to plan how to transition out of the phase. You got to think about the resources being transitioned back, people, team members, Maybe physical resources being transitioned back. These are all things we think about. But do you know that in the world of Agile, we see this in a different lens? The way we plan closure in Agile is different. And again, I want my buddy Roy to come talk about this, how we perceive closure in the world of Agile. Why do we look at it differently? And how can we look at it with this background that some of us have in predictive how do we need to flip the switch? Let's go. Absolutely. So the first part is that we're doing a lot of these activities throughout the project. So shutting down an agile project is should be trivial. 
it, you know, all this work, or at least most of this work should be already done. We're also not doing phases. So it's not just closing down a project. You know, this is all talking about shutting down phases. We don't do phases, right? We're always looking on continuous delivery, value, you know, value delivery. So there really are no phases. It's just the next thing we're delivering. It's very little to do at the end of a project or at, uh, in order to, you know, just, you know, dot those I's and cross those T's. Now, there may be some final things that you do want to do, you know, especially when you're talking about procurement, you know, and buttoning up all the financials, that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. But again, you should be doing a lot of that work already along the way. Uh, there can be some value in doing a retrospective for the overall work. Uh, go ahead and do so. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, but again, these should be pretty quick meetings, nothing really that that uh, that onerous. Uh, don't have massive meetings. They, they generally don't work. So shutting down an Agile project is really pretty simple. It should be pretty close to just pushing the button and saying we're done. That's where we want to get to. But it might take you some time to, to get all of that, act, to be able to do all those activities throughout the project, right? Yeah, Roy, so let's look at an example. Product owner suddenly gets word that a bunch of things in the product backlog aren't needed and needs to, you know, discontinue work. How, what would that look like if the product owner realized, wow, we got all the value we need? What happens? It's an awesome thing, right? So keep <laughs> in mind that we want to have that mindset that every time we're delivering something, it could be potentially the, the final delivery, right? Mm. So it's always, we are always prepared for shutting down. It, it's sort of like, you know, a, you know, watching a television series, series that's always prepared to be canceled, right? <laughs> yes. so you're just, you know, think about how you're going to write that, you know, have some conclusion at, the, at every delivery so that it feels like this thing is completed and ready to go at all times. So that, that means you're always prepared for shutting down. Always prepared for shutting down. Thank you for our buddy Roy there. Awesome coverage. Let's talk about this in the closed project or phase process. Which of the following inputs is used? Ooh. That's a tricky one. What do you think? All right. It's a short question. It's one of those you either know it. <laughs> you either know it or you don't. Huh? Okay. The answer to this question, my friends, is not Lessons Learned Repository. Let's talk about why it's not Lessons Learned Repository. It's not Lessons Learned Repository because that is where we put our lessons learned after the project. So it's actually not an input to closing out a project or phase. It is also not the final report because we get the final report as an output. It's not an input. And it's not verified deliverable because that has long since been taken care of um, in the validate scope process. You see, verified deliverable becomes an input to validate scope. From validate scope, we get an output called accepted deliverables, and that's what really goes to close project or phase. That's kind of the, the, the mechanism. So the best answer here is quality report. That is the only correct input. Okay, it's a little bit of a, it makes you think, it makes you actually think, what do you mean by quality report? What do you mean by final report? So quality report is state of the union address for quality on the project. How well are we doing? What is going awry? And so on. Final report is what you get out, not what you put in. Okay, a little trickery there. It's always fun to have a little bit of trivia. Let's move into our final domain. Now, for those of you who have not read the PMP exam content outline, there is a document out there, it's free, and it has all of these tasks I've been talking about from start to end, okay? I would love for you to just Google or look for a link below if I'm able to put that link in there, and you'll be able to download the PMP exam content outline, you'll be able to read it. But the exam content outline on its own does not have a whole lot of substance. And that's why I usually recommend coming into our bootcamp. For those of you just come in, we have our hpmexam.com. HPM just stands for hybrid project management because PMP exam has become extremely hybrid. So for you to get in on the next bootcamp coming up, I need you to go on down to hpmexam.com. I need you to sign up so that you'll be part of this awesome offer. Not only are you gonna be getting the training, as I said, you're gonna be getting a boatload of stuff. First of all, you're going to be getting over 20 hours of audio, MP3. This is stuff you can listen to all throughout your PM journey. Not just PMP, but even after. It keeps you sharp, right? So you get that. You also get lifetime access to a 40-hour online program. Lifetime. 
You also get access to life after the PMP exam. You'll be able to be on a boot camp with me. Now you're a PMP guru, right? You're now looking for how to get to the next level. You'll be on my boot camp. You become one of the champions and you will learn how to be a real success, not just based on PMBOK stuff, but based on pragmatic real world experiences that I've had training firms like the US Army, the US Air Force, NASA, the FBI, and many more. Worked in firms like Honeywell and Motorola doing project and program management. All my secrets, all those secrets, how I got to where I am, what I recommend that you do for your career, you're gonna get all that and a whole lot more. In addition to that, my friends, you're also gonna get the PDF downloads of these books, Agile Principle Run and Cut. This is a book for life. Like if you're actually keen on becoming an agile trainer, an agile coach who helps take people through the crazy trajectory, this book is for you. It contains a lot of pragmatism. Then we have Project Management Essentials, another great book that has stood the test of time. This book has been around for over a decade, has helped people in scores of countries get certified. And we have the unique PMP exam immersion, which covers the content by task. So all this stuff I'm going through with you right now is also covered by task. In fact, you can get, if you just want the book, you can get the book at immersion.hpmexam.com or immersion.pmradio.org, one of those links, okay? So get on the program. What are you waiting for? Jump on it right now. We've got a ridiculous killer deal. It's, it, it's, it's ridiculous because you're getting two lifetime access courses. You're getting a boatload of books. You're getting audio content. You're getting video content. You're getting two mock exams. You're getting several mini and micro mock exams. This is the solution that is going to help you not only get to PMP, but beyond. And you're also going to be able to tap into study groups when we have students studying for the exam, they get together on the weekends and they huddle like a scrum, you know, just like in the world of rugby, and they move the ball by going through questions together. I mean, it is absolutely awesome. It's an experience you don't want to miss, okay? Go on down right now, hpmexam.com. Okay. Well, my friends, we're moving into the final, the grand finale. I'm glad that you stayed all the way. We're going into the business domain. Business domain. What's in the business domain? Well, we have four simple things. The four simple things are plan and manage project compliance, evaluate and deliver project benefits and value, evaluate and address the external business environment changes for impact and scope, and support organizational change. Very straightforward. So let me go over these with you. Number one, planning and managing compliance. This is your responsibility, project manager, right? This is not just about project compliance within the firm. We might have some regulatory, some legal, and other kinds of compliance things that we need to worry about. You know, for example, the Americans with Disability Act. That's a regulatory need. So we may need to make sure on our projects that we are operating at the level of compliance expected with those regulations, especially if we're doing, think about user interface kind of applications, right? In more traditional approaches, we might do it with more documentation, more reviews and all that. In Agile, we might do it more with a DOD. We call it definition of done. The definition of done. The Agile Alliance defines this as an agreed upon list of the activities necessary to get a product increment to a done state, right? And we manage this in all the frameworks we do, whether it's Kanban or it's Scrum or it's Scrumban, we need to manage compliance. So there's no uh, exits when it comes to compliance in PMI's world. Number two, evaluate and deliver project benefits and value. So all this is saying is you got to make sure that you are delivering the benefits that were identified at the beginning and value. So what's the difference between benefits and value? Well, value is the net benefits. We talk about all the benefits realized, tangible, intangible. That's what value is when you, when you take all of those benefits and you put them together. 
And that's a general idea. And as a project manager, you want to make sure that the benefits are identified. You want to make sure that there's ownership and there's someone who is ensuring that benefits are realized. It could be a benefits owner, could be a benefits manager, something of that nature. Let's move on to number three. Evaluate and address external business environment changes for impact and scope. You gotta survey what's happening in the marketplace. I mean, I talk about this all the time. The companies that are not looking and are not doing boundary spanning, not looking at what is happening outside of the firm in the wider marketplace, they're gonna be here tomorrow. Likelihood of them being here is very, very minuscule. Those organizations not looking into new technologies, emerging technologies like AI, they will not be here for much longer. It's guaranteed. <laughs> it's guaranteed. You look at the likes of Kodak. Where's it, where are the fancy cameras now? It's all been replaced. It's all been replaced by Tim Cook and, and, and the great work of Steve Jobs and, and, and others. It's been replaced by, okay, Android fans. I didn't forget you, right? It's been replaced by that. So you always got to be looking at the marketplace and what is happening as a project manager, as a product owner. You got to bring that understanding back and you got to pivot when you need to. You know, I, I think a lot of firms are guilty of not pivoting. They just freewheel and they're totally oblivious to what is happening in the marketplace. But we don't want to be like that. We got a boundary span. We got to look outside of the firm, find the edges. Okay, these are the boundaries, but what are we missing that could hurt us? What are we missing? I think Google woke up and smelt the coffee regarding the iPhone and um, we have Android as an answer. And you look at the market share of Android, it's humongous. But that wouldn't have been the case if they were not looking over the fence <laughs> to spy what is going on. You know, the likes of Samsung, I think they have a few lawsuits as a result, but nonetheless, they're almost unscathed. But in all seriousness, it makes sense to look at the environment around you. That's all this task is saying. Let's move on to the final one. The final one is support organizational change. So assess organizational culture, evaluate the impact of organizational change to the project and determine required actions. And lastly, evaluate the impact of the project to the organization and determine required actions. And that's it, my friends. We have gone through people, process, and business. And so far, we've probably spent about a minute and 12. Now, can you imagine multiplying that by three, being in a classroom with me for half a day? Can you imagine that? A half day boot camp with your buddy Phil, where I'm taking you through all that is needed for PMP success, showing you the peaks, the valleys, the highs, the lows, the secrets, which is why I want you right now, I need you to go take action. But first of all, I am appreciative that you stay this long because I know a lot of people came through during the webinar, but thank you for coming and staying all the way to the end. Because now this is where I urge you to take action by going down to hpmexam.com and signing up for this brilliant half day bootcamp. You're going to be so glad you did because beyond the half day boot camp, you're going to get all the lifetime access courses and the books and the audio and the mentoring and coaching. It's going to take you levels above where you are now. This boot camp is not just about getting you certified. It's about helping you to kill the game, to be a boss. When I say a boss, I mean you are in the boss driver's seat. And the way you get there is by getting certified and then continuing the journey. For those of you who might already be PMPs and you're like, well, Phil, I wish I would have been able to capitalize on this. Well, it's all is not lost. If you want to be part of my program um, where I teach PMPs after the exam, well, you need to go on down to the website. It's leadership avenue.com for those of you who are already PMPs if you want to be part of my coaching for four months to take you levels above your PMP go on down to leadershipavenue.com okay when you get to leadership avenue you'll see the program and like I said this people who get this PMP program 
It's like getting that for free. It's ridiculous. But take advantage because these offers are not going to last. This is the last month you're going to be able to get it at that affordable rate. To get PMP training, to get an agile book for life, a book on predictive project management that makes it rather agnostic, and this awesome publication that brings it all together to hybridize it. Plus 20 hours of audio, plus two mock exams, several quizzes. The options are endless. Let's take action, my friends. Go on right now, hpmexam.com. I want to see you in my boot camp. I want to see you in my half-day boot camp. We've got one coming up pretty close. And we have them all throughout the year, but you got to keep your eye on that page. Right? Because seats go quick and the opportunity goes quick. So go on down there right now. I would love to see you in the training. Okay? Do you have any questions, comments, concerns? If there are any roadblocks I can remove for you, I would love for you to put a comment down below or to the side, wherever you're watching, whether you're on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, wherever you are. Put those comments there and I'll get back to you with answers to your questions, okay? I sincerely wish you all the very best. I'm going to show you one more piece of valuable information. I told you I was going to be covering the mindsets for the PMP exam. I'm going to show you my 36-step mindset mantra. And there are three mantras, people, process, and business. Are you ready? Let's jump into it. People mindset mantra. Number one. Make your customer success a primary goal. Advancement. Work with the customer to move the project forward. Any options that don't move the project forward are likely wrong. Fairness. Treat others fairly. <coughs> Excuse me. Steward. Protect resources entrusted to you. And treat those resources with care. I've been speaking for one hour straight, so do excuse me. All right, team, focus on stakeholders and team health and well-being. Team trust, trust the team and their judgment. Allow them to choose their way of working. Number seven, serve and leader. Defend the team and be a diversion shield and facilitate conflict resolution. Number eight, mentor, coach, serve and guide the team instead of using punishment and coercion. Number nine, integrity. Do not abuse your position or title or be partial in your actions. Number 10, honesty. Be honest and truthful in all your dealings, even if it may offend others. Number 11, leadership. Be courageous to lead and make tough decisions and tough conversations. Make trade-offs. And last but not least, we have agility. Be agile and adapt to be, that word is resilient. Be agile and adapt to be resilient. Let's continue. Let's go over to the next domain. Next domain, process domain. The process mindset mantra is life cycle. First, select and tailor the appropriate project life cycle and development approach. Number two, hybridize. Hybridize where necessary to maximize value and options. Number three, agile mindset. Seek to deliver incrementally. Plan iteratively where possible. Number four, Think systemically and strategically to navigate complexity. Number five, change. Manage change and configuration with intentionality. Number six, inspect, adapt. Continuously inspect, adapt, and integrate all levels and layers. Number seven, problem solve. Be a problem solver. Offer solutions and not problems. Number eight, quality and the iron triangle. Proactively build in quality and manage the iron triangle. Number nine, risk and governance. We talked about this. Proactively manage risk and governance. Number 10, manage all areas. Logically plan and manage all knowledge areas. Number 11, buy-in and authorization. Seek authorization and buy-in when necessary. Number 12, close in. Close each stage, iteration or phase 
with a retrospective or a lessons learned. I hope you can see that. Okay. Final one is business. The business mindset mantra is as follows. Environment. Observe and respond to the external and internal environment. Number two, outcomes. Focus on outcomes, value, and benefits over output. Number three, organization change. Set the stage for organizational change and build alliances. Number four, project impact. Assess the project's impact on the organization and navigate accordingly. Number five, organization impact. Assess the organization's impact on the project and navigate accordingly. Number six, benefits. Proactively ensure management of benefits and their realization. Number seven, value swap. Swap out the backlog items with work of com comparable value. This is used a lot in Agile. I'll call it dynamic scope option. Number eight, value delivery. Strategically plan the value delivery system. That's the projects, programs, and portfolios. You've got to strategically plan them. Number nine, compliance. Proactively manage compliance. Number 10, sustainable community. Harness COPs, PMOs, and VDOs for the firm's strategic advantage. COP, community of practice, PMO, project management office, VDOs, value delivery office. Number 11, lean thinking. Think and be lean to eliminate waste at all levels of the value delivery system. And number 12, gating. Use toll gates, stage gates, kill points, and phase end reviews to deliver only value. And with that, my friends, we've come to the end of a nano boot camp where I have walked you through people, process, and business. Walked you through the knowledge areas and the process groups. And there's a lot more that I would love to cover with you, but I need you to go on down right now to hpmexam.com. Take advantage of this boot camp where we cover people, process, and business. Remember, you have a trusted friend in your buddy, Phil, right? You have someone who has been there, done that for all these awesome organizations across the world. So many organizations, so many individuals, so many entities. You cannot go wrong. You want someone who's been doing this for a while, been doing this since 05, 2005. It's going on 16, what am I saying? 19 years. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Going on 19 years. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and share. All throughout this channel, we have tons of videos because I've dedicated a lot of my career to helping people excel and advance in project management. I would love to help you as well. So again, look for the link, hpmexam.com. I am looking forward to seeing you in the class not only to get PMP certified, but also to get the pinnacle of your profession. You know, the pinnacle of the profession is when you put in the very best that you've got with pragmatism, with coaching, with understanding and leadership. And that's why after you get certified, I would love to take you through my curriculum, how to succeed after the PMP exam. It's all part of the package. It's all part of it. But you need to take action now. hpmexam.com. Don't let that pricing get away. The pricing is cray cray. It's, it's unbelievable. The pricing structure that I have for you, it's like, just give me, just get free. Just put free on it because I'm giving you two very high-class, world-class courses for the price of a quarter. That's really what it boils down to because you're going to have lifetime access to two solid programs. And then you're going to get all of this great literature. Oh, I can barely even lift it. All of this great literature, PMP exam immersion, the essentials book. I mean, one of these books costs almost half of the program, but you're, go you're going to get all of them. You're getting all of them. The Agile Run and Cut with my buddy Roy. And then Life After the Exam. And then you're going to get 40 hours of education online for your PMP. And another 10 hours, both online and another 10 on Zoom. 
So you, that's like 20 PDUs. It's, it's just, who does that? Who gives you all of that for this very affordable amount, okay? If you need to use, whether you're using a card, you have the access, the option to do that. If you want to use PayPal, you have the option to do that. I've made it very simple and very straightforward for you, okay? Again, for those of you who are just coming, we're talking about the hpmexam.com course. It's called a hybrid project management exam for a reason. Because the PMI, they're going to ask you, people, process, business, agile, hybrid, predictive. That's why we call it hpmexam.com. Okay? All right. Any questions? Yes, lifetime does mean lifetime. For those of you asking, does lifetime mean I can have it for life? Yes. It's a lifetime access program. Once you're locked in, it's yours for life. And of course, all the books and all the materials and 20 hours of audio, yeah, that's yours for life. Okay, any other questions? So the passing score of the PMP exam is undisclosed. The PMI, they have a process that is similar to the Angoff cutoff technique, but the, the passing score is not disclosed. They'll grade you on people process business. Are you above target? Are you on target? Are you below target? Are you needs improvement? You want to be above target on all those areas. In my mind, as you know, just resign, you're going to be above target. Don't plan to be on target. You know, Les Brown says, shoot for the moon, and at least if you miss, you'll land among the stars. So <laughs> don't shoot for target, because if <laughs> things could go wrong. So I want you to shoot for above target. That needs to be the mindset. Don't, don't, don't plan target. No, target, nah. Above target, okay? Thank you all very much. I look forward to looking uh, for some comments, for some uh, questions, for some dialogue from you, all right? Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, share with your friends, and I'll see you in more videos on this channel. All right, thank you for staying this long. All the very best, and bye for now.